Hi everyone, my name is John Cohen. I am from Gearbox Entertainment. I'm here today to talk to you about Borderlands 3 user research, revisiting old methods and innovating new approaches in franchise testing. So a little bit about myself. Again, hi, I'm John. I am the user research manager at Gearbox Entertainment down in Frisco, Texas, just a little north of Dallas. And a little bit about myself. I am a big tabletop game player. However, over the past year or so, I've been doing a lot less of that and a bit more of this as we all learn to navigate gaming online. So with this talk, what I'd like to do is uh, speak a bit about the user research that we conducted for Borderlands 3 during its development, uh, as well as, as the talk uh, implies, revisiting both old methods and talking about new approaches to testing. So a quick outline of the talk. And we're going to start by discussing user research and the user research team at Gearbox. Then we'll give you a quick overview of the Borderlands franchise. Then we're going to dive into some case studies uh, looking at both established methods that we've used from the past in testing this franchise, as well as the new approaches we've integrated into our testing portfolio. And then we'll end with some takeaways and looking ahead, uh, in both back and ahead, I suppose now, uh, at how things have been working for the user research team since we started working in a remote environment. So the goals for this talk are really about methods. This is a discussion of combining methods, things that have worked for the user research group in the past, the established methodologies we've relied on, as well as the new approaches that we've begun incorporating into our testing uh, based on inspiration from academia, the literature, et cetera. Now to do this, we're going to illustrate these methods with Borderlands 3 case studies. And we split this up into three case studies looking at established methods and three case studies looking at new approaches. So I do want to talk for a moment about the takeaways that I have for you folks in the audience uh, at the outset of this talk, just so that it's in the back of your mind, helping to frame things as we continue this discussion about methods. The first is always continue iterating and improving on your established methods. There's always more that you can learn, more that you can incorporate, things that you can refine. The second thing is look to existing research outside of games for inspiration for user testing in games. And the third, you know, incorporate these new methods when it's appropriate to answer questions that you have, that your development teams have, uh, and so forth. All right, let's now talk about Borderlands 3 user research, the user research team, the project, and kind of some introductory overview uh, material before we dive into those case studies. So whenever I give a presentation to the company, let's say a quarterly meeting, I always like to start by discussing the mission statement of the user research team just to help remind everybody what it is we're doing. So that mission statement is to understand the user's experience with all of our products. And to do this, we apply hypothesis-driven methods and research best practices, like all of you do. This, of course, is to inform development and publishing efforts and to help deliver the best possible experience to our customers at the end of the day. Now, the user research team covers a lot uh, for all of our projects. Uh, the Bread and butter of what we do is really play testing. We also focus on usability. We do some A-B testing, some kind of low tech paper tests and card sorting tasks. Uh, we also work very closely with Gearbox Publishing and our marketing groups uh, when helping to evaluate potential projects and also looking at how projects are landing after they've gone out the door. Now we tend to break our testing down into iterative testing and evaluative testing. Now, iterative testing is the testing we tend to do earlier in a project that is very focused around specific objectives or features, mechanics. So for example, looking at a, a specific level or a specific character or a usability issue within a menu, uh, we do this under very controlled conditions with our participants. This is much more along the lines of laboratory testing. Now the customers of these data are the designers and developers themselves. So we work very closely with individual producers and designers on the teams to make sure that we're answering those, those targeted questions. Now, as production continues and more content becomes available to test, we kind of release the reins a bit on some of these controlled aspects of our testing where we get to evaluative testing toward the end of a project. Now, this testing looks at full playthroughs, more natural gameplay with fewer controlled variables. And toward the end of a project, we hire on what we like to call playtest interns to provide us with a lot of longitudinal and deep data. The customers of our evaluative tests uh, not only include the, the producers and developers of the projects, but also the executive team, publishing when it's appropriate, the marketing groups, folks that are, are external publishers. So the, the audience begins to grow a little bit as the scope of the testing increases as well. The 
team uh, consists of three of us, uh, Kyle Beasley, Michelle Garza, and myself. Uh, these are our uh, pub mojis, as they are called, uh, fantastic artwork by our, our marketing art group uh, at Gearbox. And the user research facility in Frisco uh, consists of uh, a fantastic lobby space, a couple of really cool lab spaces, uh, a great group discussion room, uh, all of which are equipped for streaming all of our gameplay footage and uh, the, the participants video out to the studio at large. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, I very much miss this place. Uh, it's been a long time since we've been in the lab. I hope to get back there at some point soon. Um, those, uh, those chairs in the lab, uh, I have been told, are the most comfortable chairs in the entire studio. Uh, by many of our developers who come down to uh, observe and participate in internal testing. So as I mentioned, we've been working from home like all of you since last March. Uh, we have been doing remote testing since then with developers, uh, working with our devs as participants. And of course, the team has been providing uh, team reviews and expert reviews on content for all of our projects. And you know, we'll, we're going to get back to the studio one day. We, uh, we're, we're looking at development plans right now uh, about getting back. And uh, however, this talk is about the before times. In fact, uh, years ago um, during, during the development of Borderlands 3. So let's talk about the Borderlands franchise. What is Borderlands? Well, Borderlands is a looter shooter. So this is a game that combines first person shooter action and gameplay with role playing game mechanics for, as far as leveling, skills, abilities, classes go. So it combines staples of both genres. So it's a it's set in a post apocalyptic sci fi fantasy universe. It's got a huge array of characters. It's got wonderful deep RPG mechanics, as well as a very dark sense of humor. So Borderlands first came out in 2009, followed by a sequel in 2012. And in 2014, we released the pre-sequel, a game taking place in between Borderlands 1 and 2. And uh, our, our collaborators over at Telltale Games uh, released Tales from the Borderlands, a narrative-driven game set within the universe. And then Borderlands 3 came out to almost two years ago now in 2019. The Borderlands franchise has a number of staples that tend to appear in each one of the games in the franchise. Uh, for example, our friendly yellow robot Claptrap, who kind of serves as a mascot for the franchise, uh, along with some of our other characters like our Sirens, Lilith and Maya in this case. Uh, the Sirens are characters who have almost supernatural magical powers uh, within the universe and tend to function as protagonists in the game. Uh, guns, lots and lots of guns, bajillions of guns even. Uh, Borderlands is a game known for the number of guns in the different permutations and a variety of guns that are available. Uh, it is a game that has guns built um, based on procedurally generated algorithms uh, that are done in real time as you play the game. Uh, this is a, a big feature of the game and, and players always look forward to uh, seeing what new guns each new version of the game has. And of course, uh, we also have uh, we also feature plenty of uh, large monsters, uh, like the warrior in this case, uh, to use said guns on. There's also plenty of high octane frenetic action uh, as befits a first person shooter with tons of guns. Uh, there are pretty deep RPG mechanics, in this case, skill trees uh, that are also featured, of course, on many other uh, RPGs and, and other games and genres. And uh, to uh, coincide with all of the guns, you know, we have loot. We have the loot chase, uh, typically in the form of guns, uh, but also other items like shields, grenade mods, class modifications, etc. But the loot chase is a big component of the kind of core gameplay loop and uh, aspects of playing Borderlands. Now, in Borderlands 3, we introduced a number of uh, new features and mechanics to the franchise, and we also innovated or iterated upon others that previously existed. Uh, so, for example, we introduced new forms of movement, like mantling or sliding, as shown here. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a bit when we get to our case studies. We also changed how the action skill system worked and the associated skill trees with those abilities. Action skills are these unique uh, kind of character-specific abilities uh, in the Borderlands franchise. And we also traveled to new worlds for the first time. Uh, Borderlands 1, 2, and the pre-sequel all really took place in and around the world of Pandora. And for the first time, we traveled via spaceship to worlds like Eden 6 uh, with its uh, dinosaur uh, fauna. And uh, the, the kind of city world, the sci-fi city world of Promethea with the Molly Wan robot army uh, as uh, primary antagonists. 
Now, when we started testing Borderlands 3 pretty early in development, we began by focusing on characters and concept art and story elements. We then shifted to looking at usability, uh, both in terms of in-game usability issues as well as uh, menu flow and front end work. And then we started focusing on individual features. And this is really part of that iterative playtesting that I mentioned before. And as we continued into production, we started with content focused playtesting quite a bit. And I'll break this down a little bit uh, to talk about the, the general flow for a playtest in our lab. Um, but this tended to focus on individual maps, missions, uh, characters, those action skills that I mentioned before. And then towards the end of development, when we reached kind of a, a critical point where there was plenty of content to test, we started running full playthroughs with playtesters that we call our playtest interns. And I'll, I'll discuss those in more detail later in the talk. So there represented a number of interesting franchise challenges when we started testing Borderlands 3. Uh, the biggest, of course, is how do you introduce new players to this game and this franchise without fatiguing returning players? So you want to make sure that you teach what you need to teach to the new folks. Uh, but if people are coming to this franchise, perhaps after you know just finishing another playthrough of Borderlands 2, you don't want to bore or fatigue those players but you have to teach the new mechanics or you have to teach the mechanics that have changed since the last time people have played to both audiences equally. Now, this is really critical because the baseline differences in expectation and comprehension between the folks who are coming to Borderlands 3 as their first Borderlands experience and the people who have been with us since 2009 are drastically different. And of course, to do this, uh, we employed a number of different methods. So getting back to the original point of the talk, this is really about established tried and true methods that worked for us in the past, as well as the ways in which we incorporated new methods into our uh, approaches to testing Borderlands 3 to tackle these unique issues and topics. So returning briefly to the talk goals, again, this is about combining methods, what worked before and what else is out there that we could potentially capitalize on. And in a moment, we'll start talking through those, those Borderlands case studies, three with the established methods and three with new approaches. So what are the case studies? First up, we're going to talk about three case studies involving a revisitation and iteration on old methodologies. And by old methodologies, again, I mean the methods that we rely upon day in and day out when testing our products. So these three case studies are player movement tutorials, action skills, and the uh, mechanic called second wind. After that, we're going to turn over to innovating new approaches. So three case studies that involve taking approaches that were not commonplace for our laboratory and uh, using them to answer specific questions that the development teams had. And these involve gun audio, uh, navigation through the hub environment, and some interesting narrative insights. So revisiting old methods. As I mentioned before, the bulk of what we do is play testing. And I want to take a moment and talk through what those old or traditional or established methods tend to look like for us. So when testing Borderlands 3, uh, we drew upon a number of mixed methods and data sources. And I'm, I'm sure you know folks who are, are watching other talks during the course of the summit will encounter these terms quite a bit. Uh, but these are the methods that we employ and the data sources that we that we tend to look at and take advantage of. So the biggest two at the top, observational data and survey feedback. Uh, when we are testing our products in our lab, we are constantly watching what our players are doing and taking notes, making observations, uh, using those data to inform uh, inferences about their behavior, use it to, as an, uh, a prompt for follow-up questions during group discussions or interviews, uh, and in ways to supplement the qualitative feedback we get from surveys. Uh, we utilize a, a series of survey tools uh, that are often either prompted by uh, moments in gameplay or uh, benchmarks during a playtest, or sometimes they're self-motivated where we train our participants how to provide survey feedback uh, whenever they encounter something that merits it. Now, in addition to these uh, survey tools and our interviews and discussions uh, that are, are either conducted individually or in groups, uh, we often look at task metrics, uh, often in the form of video analysis. So we may give a participant a series of tasks to perform. And after the fact, uh, postdoc, we can look at the video, code it, uh, and analyze the, the metrics associated with success or failure or time to completion, uh, so on and so forth. And when we have the opportunity to look at game telemetry, we'd like to, uh, because it provides really great objective feedback and often quantitative measurements that provide an additional vector of, of data that can support a lot of the qualitative feedback we're getting from our participants. Now, the other part of this is that we broadcast all of our playtests from our lab to not only 
our control space where we can observe this directly, getting that observational data, but also to the entire studio at large, so that all of our developers can watch in real time what our participants are doing. So we have utilized a great service that our IT department has created for us uh, to broadcast every single player's gameplay footage and their face in a little picture in picture in window, just like you're seeing right now with me, uh, so that they can observe what our participants are doing in the lab. Uh, we also utilize Slack and Microsoft Teams uh, to communicate with our developers in real time so they can provide uh, observations themselves because the more eyes, the better. Uh, they can also ask us questions and uh, prompt us during group discussions because we also broadcast that. Uh, so those two approaches, this mixed method with multiple, both qualitative and quantitative data sources, as well as this you know, broad communication to the studio at large uh, is the way in which we tend to approach playtesting. Now this diagram here is something I, I, I uh, communicate out to our developers during all of our quarterly meetings. Uh, this showcases how everybody at the studio at Gearbox is a part of user research. We, we use this as a way of communicating that uh, we really need developers to get involved before, during, and after a play test to kind of help that close that feedback loop. Uh, but this reinforces the idea that they should be taking part by observing, by asking questions, uh, by getting involved through our streaming tech as well as through Slack or Teams. Now, the average participant in the before times, it's been a while, uh, <laughs> will enter into our user research facility via the lobby where we will uh, onboard them. They'll sign a non-disclosure agreement. We'll talk a little bit about physical security, informational security, and then we'll, we'll bring everybody involved in the playtest into our group discussion room. Now, we start a playtest here because it gives us an opportunity to A, to have people store their belongings in lockers, which are just off off screen in that image. Uh, but it also gives us a chance to talk more in depth about the non-disclosure agreement. And we can also discuss the methodology of the day. So we can discuss the procedure, the game that we're playing, if that's if we want to tell them ahead of time. Uh, sometimes we keep that secret. And uh, we also can go into uh, the kinds of feedback we're looking for, the kinds of feedback we're not looking for, uh, the ways in which they'll be providing feedback so we can set ex expectations accordingly. And uh, we can answer any questions to level set all of the participants before we, we bring them in groups into our two different lab testing rooms. Uh, so here's an image, of course, of lab one. Lab two is identical to it, just farther down the hallway. Uh, each one can support up to eight participants at once. We have PCs and consoles in each one, and uh, players you know, utilize headsets, so we minimize noise disruption. Uh, and whether we're doing multiplayer testing uh, or, or single player testing of any kind, uh, we will often fill up both rooms uh, to increase our sample size. So participants will engage in whatever the test is of the day. It could be a 15 minute menu analysis. It could be a four hour gameplay test. It could be a three day test where at the end of each day, participants go home and the expectation is they're going to come back the next day to continue their gameplay. Um, most of the time, they show up again, which is great. Uh, participants are rewarded with swag of various kinds, things that they can only get through playtesting with us. Um, and we wrap our, our playtests back in that group discussion room. Uh, principally because we want to run a group discussion. Uh, and you can see the, the big screen TV. Uh, not picture there is the webcam that we use to broadcast the group discussion out to the rest of the studio. Uh, sometimes we'll bring uh, individual participants in one at a time to do, uh, it, sorry, to conduct interviews with them rather than running a full group discussion. And on occasion, we'll also have developers visit the lab uh, and take part in group discussion. You can see a couple of couches on screen there. Uh, so the beginning and the end of each playtest uh, happens in that room with the actual playtesting itself uh, tends to occur in our lab rooms. That just gives you a kind of quick showcase through uh, the various spaces in the user research lab. And I really am looking forward to getting back there. All right, let's talk case studies. This is the meat and bones of the talk. So let's first talk about player movement tutorials. So when we just so keeping in mind all the the uh, old methods that tried and true stuff we just talked about, let's dive right in. So I mentioned earlier that uh, we introduced some new movement capabilities in Borderlands 3, uh, things like sliding and mantling. So here's an image of sliding. Uh, we also brought something back from Borderlands, the pre-sequel called the ground slam or the butt stomp, where a player can jump from a, a very tall height and hit the crouch button and slam down, make a melee attack into the ground, doing some area of effect damage. Now these were, with the exception of the ground slam, sli sliding and mantling you know, are brand new to the franchise. So we conducted a number of play tests uh, very early in development to kind of getting into production where we took some observational notes and we got a bunch of survey feedback that indicated that while there was a tutorial present in the very first mission of the game, 
where players received these brief prompts to mantle into slide, um, things were not reinforced. After they received those prompts the first time, they never appeared again, and there was nothing that was reinforcing or requiring that gameplay to really, you know, uh, teach the fact that these were new mechanics and new mobility features in the game. So we actually found through observation that players had difficulty mantling up almost required golden path, you know, uh, places multiple hours into the game. And of course, this is problematic if players actually have to mantle later on and they just don't know how to. Do it. So the solution here uh, from the development team is quite elegant. Uh, they actually built some more content for us. They developed a brand new side mission that helped with additional training, providing reinforcement and reward. So what was the side mission? Let's call bad reception. It's av available very early in the game, right after you complete the kind of core tutorial area uh, in the first boss fight. And in fact, it requires new movement, mantling, sliding, ground slam, in order to complete objectives. In this case here, you have to uh, ground pound or uh, butt stomp this uh, specific location in order to complete the objective. And this provides reinforcement, of course. So players understand, oh, I actually have to do this in order to complete certain things in the game. So they're more likely to engage in it moving forward. And of course, like all good Borderlands missions, it provides you with a reward at the end. Hey, look, it's Claptrap. He gives you the mission. He wants a bunch of weird hats. And uh, in order to get them, you have to mantle and slide and butt stomp. And he gives you some, some cash at the end. So great side mission, provided that reinforcement reward. And what we found is with additional reinforcement, we had greater engagement. So interestingly enough, the novelty of these new movement features was, was not enough for our returning franchise fans to engage in that content. One might think that, oh, the presence of mantling or sliding for the very first time in a Borderlands game would really capture the attention of those returning fans. It wasn't the case. So in fact, we had to, inf had to reinforce that. So observational player data, re uh, player reported data in the form of surveys and interviews and group discussions, as I mentioned before, revealed this issue and helped inform a brand new mission. All right, moving on, second case study. Now let's talk about action skills, those unique abilities. So again, these are a franchise stable. They are special abilities unique to each character. And uh, they look something like this. So for example, you might be able to uh, use six powerful siren arms to slam into the ground, uh, causing an area of effect attack. Uh, you might be able to deploy a drone or a shield or even duplicate yourself as Zane the Operative. They often help define the nature of a character and they can really shape and inform gameplay. They provide that kind of uh, uh, cornerstone to a player's strategy and they can base their entire uh, kit around a particular action skill and set of abilities. Now in Borderlands 1, 2, and the pre-sequel, each character, each playable character had one action skill available to them. So one character, that was, they had their action skill that was unique to them. In Borderlands 3, there are three action skills per character. So we increased complexity quite a bit. And not only that, we introduced additional augmentations uh, and, and um, attunements that were available to each action skill that could change the way an action skill behaved. So a bunch of complexity from two different factors. So what we found from a whole lot of playtesting, uh, we're talking playtesting from individual missions even up through full playthroughs, uh, that while players really understood their passive skills, these, these uh, abilities that were always functional once you placed skill points into them, um, they understood how those worked, uh, arguably because they were the returning piece from the franchise. Every other Borderlands game has passive skills. Players understand you put points into them. They augment you somehow. Typically, uh, numbers go up, you do more damage, your reload speed increases, you move faster, you heal faster. Uh, and, you know, they're also common in many other games, so it, it stands to reason that this was the piece that made sense. What didn't make sense to those players were how the action skills worked, mainly because it required you to not only pick one, but slot one in to a loadout. Now, this was a brand new step that the previous games did not require. Because you only had one action skill, as soon as you gained access to it, it was there. It was yours. You didn't have to do anything with it. Well, now when you have a choice of three, you need to pick which one you want and toss it into your loadout. There's an additional step required to even make it function. And as far as those augments go, the, the different ways you can modify an action skill, um, players had no clue how to unlock them. They had no clue how to slot them in. They had no idea what they did. It was a black box. So the solution here, uh, thanks to our fantastic UI and UX groups, uh, were some new tutorials. 
that walked players through how to handle and approach each of these pieces of the action skill system. Now, at first, they built tutorials that kind of unloaded all this information onto the player at once. Um, unsurprisingly, this was a bit too much. Now, uh, when players unlock their action skill, it's actually up to an hour or more until they get their first passive and potentially even longer until they get their first uh, augment or what we call a wing skill. We'll show you why in a moment. So version two uh, transform these uh, and parse them out into contextual to almost uh, uh, benchmark uh, sensitive tutorials. So a separate tutorial for the action skills, the passive and the augments respectively. Well, let me show you what I mean by this. So when you reach level two, you unlock your action skill and get this great notification. And from there, the game tells you a little bit about your skills and what action skills do. This is character specific. Here we're looking at the Siren Amara. And when you enter into your skill screen for the first time, it walks you through how to equip an action skill. It tells you how to pick one of the three and equip it in your loadout. And then once you do it, hey, you get a great notification that says you've done this, fantastic. And then come back later when you've, when you've received additional skill points so we can teach you about other things later. So when you come back after you get your skill point, what happens? Ah, another tutorial pops up. So it tells you, hey, leveling up grant skill points, time to spend them on your passives. Now this is the part that players tend to understand from previous games. Uh, so cool, you can spend some points on a passive ability. There we go. And here it tells you that as you progress, you're going to unlock new action skills and augments. Great, so that reinforces the idea that there are gonna be more choices later on. When you return after having spent enough skill points to unlock your first wing skill, and here we call it a wing skill because they are located on the edges or the wings of each of those trees. Uh, this is where typically the augments are found. Uh, a third tutorial uh, prompts you to equip one of those for the first time. And then we'll explain that you can mix and match them. So we drastically evolved the core feature of the game, introduced a ton of additional complexity by tripling the number of action skills available to players per character, adding in augments and wing skills and changing how the, the uh, creation of a loadout worked. So we had to teach the new, the new pieces of this. So with our the observational data we collected indicated that our players were not interacting with these features. They had no idea how to slot their, their action skill. And the survey and the interview data that, that coincided with this indicated that they didn't understand the feature. It makes, makes sense. If you don't understand something, it's kind of hard to interact with it correctly. So this helped inform the tutorial iteration that we just went through. Uh, and of course, after the tutorials were implemented, we saw that both comprehension and use of these systems improved quite a bit. All right, our third case study using our traditional playtesting methods. Second Wind. What is Second Wind? Second Wind is a self-revive mechanic in Borderlands. Uh, so when you take enough damage to be knocked down, uh, you're given an opportunity to revive yourself by getting a kill on an enemy, uh, before a certain amount of time has passed. And if you do that, you'll revive and you'll get a second wind. A portion of your health is restored and you're told, hey, cool, you got a second wind, time to get back into combat. So this is actually really core to combat and is really key to success and engagement in, in the core loops of a Borderlands game. Losing all of your health doesn't mean you're done. It means you need to refocus and get a kill very quickly. Otherwise, you will in fact die and respawn and have to repeat some content. So this is, this is critical and core to the franchise. It's been a staple from the very beginning. Now, knowing that, let's talk about a very specific case where Second Wind uh, was not, not being done the way that the developers intended it. So the Rampager, what's the Rampager? The Rampager is a big boss fight, big vault monster. Uh, the Rampager uh, is encountered at the end of the very first act of the game. Uh, it's a huge boss fight. Typically, these vault monsters in previous games come at the very end of a game. Now, well, Borderlands 3, uh, just like it increased the number of action skills available to each character, also increased the number of vault monster fights that the player encountered. And the Rampager is unique as well because it has multiple uh, multiple phases that it uh, enters, uh, and it's, it physically transforms, its abilities change, at some point it begins to fly. Well, floating around the Rampager are these luminescent birds. Now the intention for these luminescent bird-like creatures was that they're supposed to be used as a second wind because they can be shot and killed very quickly. So again, if a player loses all of their health, all they need to do is look up and fire at one of these birds and they can get that second wind to keep fighting the rampager. Well, we found that players weren't using birds to get their second wind. 
time after time, we would watch a player get to the Rampager and watch with bated breath as we, we hoped we, we, that this player would actually look up and use those birds. And time and again, we found that that was not the case. There were all the other ground-based enemies uh, that were available for players to, to focus their fire on and get second wins, uh, which they did. However, those required multiple shots, multiple rounds, uh, whereas the birds would take one shot. They, they were the, the easy pickings for a second wind. Well, what the heck was going on? Well, we inferred that they were not connecting those birds to combat. They weren't considering those birds to be valid targets to get a second wind off of. This may have been complicated by the fact that during the Rampager's phase changes where it physically transforms, it, it, it enters into this invulnerable state in an animation plays where, where it draws in these birds, like it's somehow powering up using them. So we, we surmise that players were, were associating the birds with that phase change and not being available as a second wind. Well, what did the developers do to address this? This is one of my favorite examples. So we showed them how to do this by example. This is great. So in this section of the game uh, on Promethea, where you, you are racing to the vault and eventually you encounter the Rampager, you are accompanied by an NPC, Maya. Now Maya was one of our sirens. Uh, she was a playable character in Borderlands 2, returned as an NPC in Borderlands 3, much beloved character in the franchise. Maya accompanies you during this massive stretch of vehicle combat and racing through tunnels and fighting enemies, and then she's there with you during the Rampager fight. So the developers said, okay, we have something that we can use to show the players that these, these bird creatures can be shot at and that they are functionally you know, available as targets for, for second wind. So right before the player jumps down a chute and enters into the, the boss arena space where they fight the Rampager, uh, they enter into a brand new map and you spawn into this map looking straight ahead at Maya. So what the developers did is they added some of these birds and they had Maya shoot them right in front of you. Your attention is not drawn elsewhere. There are no enemies. You're looking straight ahead. There's nothing threatening you. And most of the time you're gonna be able to see Maya firing at these birds. And in fact, when she shoots them, loot drops out. And that, if nothing else, is the telltale sign that, hey, these things are, are available as targets to the player. So after that change was implemented, we saw both through observational data, which we later confirmed with direct questioning of our players, that yes, they understood that these creatures could be used for, for a, gaining a second win during the fight with a Rampager. So these data helped inform a, a small change uh, that had a huge impact on, on the player. All right, so where are we so far? Uh, we've talked about three case studies involving a revisitation of old methods, these tried and true methodologies, these playtesting methods that we utilize. So when, with player movement tutorials, we saw that uh, the data we collected through um, surveys, group discussions, observational data, comments from developers that, hey, players needed additional tutorials and reinforcement, so that informed some side mission training. Uh, with our action skills, we saw that the increased complexity from our action skill system in Borderlands 3 required additional contextual tutorials. And with our second win mechanic, we saw that uh, through showing by example, we could increase player awareness of how to gain a second win during a critical moment with a boss fight. Now let's turn our attention to the latter part of the talk, which is all about innovating with new approaches uh, from outside traditional user testing. So again, we have three case studies, and the first one involves gun audio. So let's flash back a couple of years to pretty early in the development of Borderlands 3, where our audio team came to us uh, with an interesting question about the audio system they were developing for our guns. Now, there are robust gun systems that underlie the core mechanics of how guns are built in Borderlands games. Uh, these guns are constructed out of multiple parts. Uh, they have different identities, different manufacturers with different abilities, and the combinatorics of all of these different pieces lead to the sheer number of guns that players can encounter during, during a playthrough. Uh, so the audio team was working on a system that was equally robust so that there would be some distinction sound-wise uh, between all these different guns. They asked us this interesting question of, do players like or appreciate the different sounds that our guns make? They wanted to understand if, if it was worth continuing down this road of building this, this robust system. Well, the user research team countered with, do they even perceive the difference? Because if you can't perceive the difference between guns, you probably aren't gonna be able to appreciate it. So to answer this question, we looked to a methodology 
called signal detection. Uh, with signal detection, we wanted to understand whether players could perceive the difference between two stimuli when that difference was present, but also correctly indicate when those differences were absent. So let's unpack this a bit more. We took sounds from shotguns and pistols in Borderlands 3, and we played them together. So uh, participants in this study listened to, to sounds that shotguns made and sounds that pistols made uh, without any visuals. And they would hear pairs of sounds. So either a pistol and a shotgun or two shotguns or two pistols, and they would make a response, same or different. So if the gun sounds that they heard were in fact different from one another and they replied different, well, that was, that was a correct response, that was a hit. However, if the sounds were the same, but they answered different, well, that's a false alarm. That's not correctly noting when the differences are absent. And misses and correct rejections are essentially the inverse of that. So we had participants listen to these gun sounds and make these responses to try to get an understanding of whether there was a perceptual difference on the audio level between these different types of guns. The results of this study indicated the answer was yes, they can actually distinguish the difference. We had very high accuracy ratings uh, amongst our participants. They could at 100% accuracy tell us the difference between shotgun sounds and pistol sounds. And at 97 and 94% respectively, the difference between two different pistol sounds or two different shotgun sounds. In addition to accuracy, we computed a sensitivity score. This is called D prime within signal detection. And this is a measure of that sensitivity. So accuracy, but also taking into account those, those false alarms. Uh, we found that there was very high sensitivity with both the pistol and the shotgun sounds. Uh, pistols were slightly higher. So in addition to having a slightly higher accuracy, the people were a little bit more sensitive to the differences between pistol sounds. So with this study, we looked at the signal detection paradigm, which is a brand new methodology that we had never incorporated into uh, testing Borderlands content before, to look at the perceived differences between gun sounds, those pistol sounds and shotgun sounds. Uh, and these data inform the continued development of this system. The audio team was uh, thrilled to get some feedback that indicated that players could in fact perceive those differences. Our second case study involving new methods uh, was related to the hub map in Borderlands. So Borderlands 3 has a hub called Sanctuary, or Sanctuary 3, which is a spaceship that you use to travel to different worlds and interact with different characters. And this is the map that you return to very frequently as a player. Uh, not only is it a, a, the means by which you travel to new worlds, but it's also where you pick up a number of side missions, where you interact with NPCs, where you upgrade your character in various ways. So this was a space that we knew players are going to be coming back to a lot, and we wanted to provide some information and, and, and data to the design team that could help inform the layout of the space, the way it was decorated, the signage that went in place, and where those NPCs were located. Now for this study, we looked at various research paradigms in, in navigation research, uh, specifically how people navigate through novel environments and encode information about those environments. So here we had our players freely explore Sanctuary 3 for a period of time, typically about 10 minutes. We gave them a series of points of interest and NPCs that they had to visit, and they indicated that they had reached that location by meleeing that location. Uh, so we could demarcate that in the data. And after they finished exploring the ship and learning where all these places were, we gave them a series of errands. Now these errands took the form of, of multiple points of interest that were strung together with a bit of narrative uh, that tested their knowledge of the space and also simulated an in-game experience. Well, let me give you an example. So for example, players were told, hey, you just returned to Sanctuary 3 after finishing a mission. What you need to do first is go to Sir Hammerlock in his room and turn in that mission to get your reward. After that, you want to go do a couple of things around the ship in any order. So do these four things in any order that you'd like. Go visit this NPC, talk to them. Go to the shooting range and try out a new gun. Uh, go to your personal room and customize it. And go visit Claptrap to get your next mission. When you've done all four of those tasks, return to the bridge of the ship. So this was the type of errand we would give players to test their understanding of where these spaces were relative to one another. And these are the data for that errand. Now, this alluvial plot shows each player's path through the ship. Each of those gray bars you see on the uh, running across the x-axis is an individual participant's route through the ship as they completed each task in their errand set. Now, across the, the bottom of the chart, you see the order in which the, the rooms are visited. So first, second, third, and fourth, and fifth, and then leading back to the bridge. 
So what we saw is that, you know, the majority of participants after visiting Sir Hammerlock to turn in their mission would go to the shooting range. Uh, a few of them went to the, visit that random NPC, the one we called the red shirt, and one person went right to their room. So paths like this show us kind of the majority family of paths uh, that existed, which helped us understand how players were relating the various locations in the ship to one another. Now, on top of that, we got plenty of great qualitative feedback that told us a little bit more about where they were running into some problems navigating this hub space. So for example, I kind of forgot where my room was. Well, that, that's very telling. Uh, another player said it was annoying they couldn't get back up to the balcony where the ladder in Zero's room is to get back to the main floor. So this told us a little bit about how they were utilizing uh, a nav navigable space from one of their task locations back up to the main deck of the ship. So this navigation paradigm provided some great supplemental feed, supplemental data to the feedback we were collecting from players about where they were struggling, where they ran into friction points, where they got lost. And these families of paths told us that some areas were in fact easier to find than others, which helped inform the placement of NPCs, the, the deco and signage and art that went into this map. Um, the images you saw in all of the, those screenshots were, were fully arted out from the final game, but in fact, this test was run uh, before any art was added to Sanctuary 3. It was pretty much a gray box map. Uh, so these data were very helpful for uh, informing how that space was, was decorated in the final product. And what was great about this is we used some existing research models uh, that were out there in the literature to inspire how we approach this. It wasn't a one-to-one -one direct translation, uh, but we were very much inspired by, by work in navigation research. Now, our final case study involves the narrative of Borderlands 3, specifically the comp player's comprehension and engagement with the plot, its pacing, the characters. Now, at the very beginning of the talk, I talked about playtest interns. Now, these are folks that we bring aboard when we hit a critical threshold of content. Now, these playtest interns represent a methodology unto themselves. We treat them very differently uh, than playtesters who arrive for a 15 minute menu test or UX test or uh, a four hour play test on a given afternoon. Uh, these are people who are with us for one to two weeks at a time. And we focus very much on full playthrough, longitudinal feedback. So these, these folks give us consistent written feedback. We conduct numerous interviews and discussions with them. We go deep with, uh, with the developers uh, into various topics. In fact, we structure entire group discussions around single topics at times. Uh, and of course, we get lots and lots of summative feedback when they're finished with their playthrough. And this helps us highlight and understand issues that would not come to light with um, kind of slices of the game that we would be able to play test earlier in development. This is also seen as having a high value at the studio. Uh, we have massive, massive buy-in from the development teams, and the developers are actively involved in our playtest intern experiences. So here uh, is a screenshot from when we were testing Borderlands 3 with our interns. Uh, we had a Slack channel uh, with our developers, and at one point we had 160 people from the development team who were actively involved with uh, the Playtest intern program. They were observing players via the, the streaming tech that I talked about earlier. They were communicating with us directly, asking us questions, making observations. In fact, sometimes even solving problems in real time. So the narrative structure of Borderlands 3 is a prologue followed by four acts. And each act takes place on a different planet. So you start in the world of Pandora, you get your spaceship, you leave, you travel to a couple different worlds, eventually come back. Uh, so what we're really going to focus on right now is everything up to Act 2, which takes place on the world of Eden 6. So in the prologue and in Act 1, you as the player are, are focused on the antagonist called the Calypso Twins, Troy and Tyrene. Now, these are the ultimate bad guys in Borderlands 3. Uh, they are sirens, those super-powered, almost magical characters. They are the main antagonists. And at the end of Act 1, uh, they do something pretty heinous. They kill a character that you've you've grown attached to. And we saw with playtesting that, yeah, people ended Act 1 out for revenge, unsurprisingly. Well, our playtest observations and data took an interesting turn when players began Act 2. You travel to the, the swampy world of Eden 6, and an interesting thing happens. The Calypso twins kind of vanish. Uh, Eden 6 has its own subplot involving some of our other much beloved NPCs, uh, but the Calypsos themselves, they're not really seen or heard from for a little while. And this 
pretty much killed pacing for players. Uh, their engagement and interest in the storyline for Eden Six was took a major nosedive. Uh, they told us point blank in group discussions and in interviews that they weren't un they didn't understand what was happening. Um, why did the Calypsos disappear? What was going on with them? Why were they engaging in, the, in these other subplots? And these interviews and group discussions with our narrative team uh, led to a really great elegant solution. We simply add more Calypsos to Eden 6. So during la latter portions of development, the Calypsos made additional appearances and had more voiceover and dialogue uh, in, in Eden 6's plot. In fact, there were additional side missions that were added, some lore items and moments that brought the presence of the Calypsos back to a section of the game that didn't quite focus on them front and center. So this greater presence saw better engagement. Uh, with later playtest groups during our, during our intern program, uh, we saw that once these changes had been implemented, many of the pacing issues with Act 2 started to disappear. They weren't gone entirely, because again, the Calypsos weren't the focus anymore, uh, but these mitigation strategies kind of assuaged some of the larger concerns about what was going on with players' engagement with the storyline in Act 2. So while this wasn't necessarily a brand new methodology, we definitely improved our playtest intern approach when testing Borderlands 3. Uh, we increased the number of interviews that we conducted with our playtesters over time. Uh, we added more group discussions with developers, and we did more deep dives into narrative content, the stuff that, that is hard to grasp if you're only looking at a small section of the game. But if you're playing through the entire thing, you can start to understand the ebbs and flows of the storyline and where some of those critical issues are occurring. So this testing highlighted pacing and comprehension issues with the story, and not, some of these decisions that were made about how to fix the, the issues in, in Eden 6 and, and many other issues that were addressed during this part of development were done in real time. Uh, again, the studio had large buy-in to our intern program. There were many developers conversing with one another and with us uh, while the playtesters were playing content. Uh, so many of these uh, decisions and changes were, were done in real time while the players were in the lab. So to summarize the latter three case studies, uh, with our gun audio question, we looked at signal detection and found that players could hear the differences between guns. Uh, for our hub navigation study, we looked at, to navigation research and uh, had players conduct errands around the Sanctuary 3 spaceship, uh, which helped inform the layout and deco of that environment. And finally, we improved upon our, our in intern program uh, to get information and data about pacing and engagement with the narrative of Borderlands 3. So if we return to the goals of this talk, we can see that through combining established methodology, the stuff that's worked for us in the past, and by incorporating some new approaches from what's out there beyond just user testing in games, we can improve upon how we test a, a game like Borderlands 3, something in a, a new entry in a long-standing franchise. And we illustrated with six different case studies, three with established methods and three with new approaches, how exactly we did that. So this is echoed in the takeaways that we first discussed at the beginning of the talk. So iterate and improve on your established methods, those methods that you rely on day to day in your research program. Look to existing research outside of games user research and incorporate those, those methods into your research portfolio to answer questions that you or your development teams have. So over the past year, we haven't been doing any of this stuff because we've been working from home. So looking back at what we've been doing since last March and ahead to the next couple of months, um, I wanna talk a little bit about what we've been doing to innovate more methodologies while we've been remote. So since working from home, we have been working exclusively with developers as our participants. And to do this, we have created kind of two new ways of testing. Uh, one I have dubbed play at your pace. And what this means is we provide instructions and a build for one of our products to our developers, and they have a window of time, typically a week, to play test content. Now, this is done asynchronously uh, because everybody's busy, developers have full-time jobs, and they can't necessarily devote four hours in a given chunk to some content. Uh, so we give them more flexibility and more time to play content and provide feedback. And we bookend these play at your pace tests with kickoff meetings and group discussions to both level set and answer some additional questions at the beginning and also collect some, some group feedback uh, at the end of the play test. And so far, these have proven to be very effective for getting feedback from our devs uh, while everybody's busy working from home. 
Now, on top of that, uh, oftentimes we will gather some of our developers in our, our Discord server uh, to conduct one-on-one -on -one sessions where uh, developers who are not playtesting can actually jump in and observe. And this is a bit more like how things are run in our lab with that streaming tech. So a developer shares their screen via Discord and securely and privately, we, the user research team, and some of our other devs can watch what they're doing and talk to them both during the playtest and afterwards in an interview format. So we are working on plans right now to return sa safely to the lab, uh, discussing with all of the, the people that we need to about what might need to happen in order for us to return to testing in person with outside participants. We don't anticipate this happening very soon, but uh, we're looking forward to the day that we can actually bring people back in and collect feedback uh, from external users. And we're also very eager to learn from all of you. If you have thoughts and ideas and things that you've been doing, uh, both to collect feedback while you have been working from home remotely, as well as the plans that you and your lab are working on to bring people back in safely, uh, we'd love to hear it and love to learn from you. So that brings us to the end of the talk. I wanna thank a number of people. Uh, first and foremost, the user research team at Gearbox, Kyle and Michelle, as well as the Borderlands 3 team and all of Gearbox Entertainment, 2K Games and their user research team, Everybody here at the Games User Research Summit, my amazing partner, Linda, and our cat, TK, and of course, all of you. So please keep the conversation going. You can get in touch with me here. I look forward to speaking with all of you and learning from you. Uh, so enjoy the rest of the summit. Have a great afternoon, and I uh, look forward to talking with you. Thank you all again.